Hello and welcome back, students, to another week, our final exam here at the Survivor Academy. And we are in such luck today to have one of the finest instructors that we have here in all of Survivor Academy. Please welcome in the great Taryn Armstrong. Taryn, how are you? Uh, I'm doing very well. I'm uh, very excited to put my professor hat on. Uh, and, um, and maybe like one of those pointers. I've always wanted one of those pointers. What maybe would you point to? One. A chalkboard? It, I mean, does it matter? Just mm -hmm. anything. Just like, yeah. Just whip it around. You Have know? you ever thought about having like, uh, the whiteboard, uh, to be able to go to in any of the, you know, whether it's the live feed update or, uh, stock watch or, uh, you know, survivor recaps? No, because I hate writing like physically. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hate drawing physically. I hate drawing computerally also, but mm -hmm. you know, you hate just drawing. in general. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Who likes drawing? People that are good at it. Kids, yeah. Not me. Yeah. Yeah. But that being said, uh, it's so nice to have you here to talk about Survivor 42 and uh, take one last look back at things from the finale and just sort of a general note of what do the future players need to take away from uh, Survivor 42. And uh, it's been a very fun series that we've gotten to do along the way. So I'm glad we have a chance to sort of look back and talk about everything. Taryn, how have you been? I've been I've been doing well. Uh, the Big Brother season ended, Survivor ended, the Circle ended, and now uh, we've got a couple of weeks here before uh, things start to kick off again. Yeah, some downtime uh, for you. Uh, what do you do to fill this downtime? Uh, mostly just got got back to work on other things uh, like the streaming on Twitch, uh, putting together some videos from the Among Us games that we've been playing weekly for the last couple of years. Uh, I want to start releasing those on YouTube. Um, going, going back to the start. Uh, so I've been working on those and, uh, and some other stuff. Just, you know, I just, uh, I, I don't sit still very well. Okay. Overall, Taryn, um, you had to have been happy with survivor 42, right? Oh yeah. Uh, Even though I you mean, didn't win a draft this time. Mm, yes. Uh, may, maybe it came close. Uh, mm -hmm. may, maybe, uh, but, uh, no, yeah. I mean, uh, it, you know, if, if you're going to lose, you want to lose to, somebody like Marianne. You know? Yeah. Like, uh, like that's, that's a good way to lose. So, um, big picture. Um, how much do you think that survivor 42 will be a season that we look back and feel like, uh, it was a season that changed the show that changed the show. I think, I think it's going to be hard to separate 42 from 41. Mm -hmm. I think that they both played out so similarly in structure, um, and in the way that the overall meta of the strategy was, uh, was implemented, um, in terms of something that is a part of a larger trend, but I think is more exaggerated in these more recent seasons, which is, you know, the highest, uh, head that pokes out of the, the crowd gets chopped off. Um, and, uh, and then one after another, that's just how it goes. Uh, I think that's kind of the strategy of the moment. And I think that this is another representation of that with uh with Marianne being a good example of how to win in that environment. Okay. Well, let's start to bring in Marianne's win because uh obviously we did not know that she was going to be the winner from the last time that we got to talk about looking back at the season. And uh one of the great things that she did was uh the final tribal council. Candace asked us, uh what are some key points you want to mention uh and things to leave out in your final jury speech? Uh, could you get away with exaggerating the role you played in the game? Uh, I, I just thought that Marianne conducted a clinic at the final travel council of how to do the final travel council correctly. Yes, absolutely. And I think that that's, that's sort of one of the examples of, I think how Marianne was able to win in this environment, which is that um, there seems to be this idea in the players heads at this point in time, which is, we need a resume. We need big moves. And that's something that people have talked about for a while, the big moves era and all of that. And that is important because that is how the jury does look at the players. And they do want to award the biggest, best player. Um, but you can't ignore the social aspect of it. Of course, this is this is a, a tale as old as time at this point. But more specifically in this era of Survivor, 
not only the social aspect of it, but how that impacts the final jury, final tribal uh, situation where you're being questioned by the jury. And unlike a show like Big Brother, where you have approximately two minutes to explain your game, in Survivor, you have a lot of time to really explain your game, to interact with the jury, to interact with the people sitting next to you, and uh, and really make a case, really use the social bonds that you've created, the persona that you have to craft a narrative for the game that you've played and why the people should vote for you. And that's where Marianne did a really good job using her likability, the relationships that she had built, and then putting just enough um, like actual uh, action of like, this is what I did, just enough of a story about how she was strategically very sound, uh, along with some passion, and uh, and it was everything she needed. Yeah, I, I think that um, you bring up a lot of good points there. Um, the idea of the the resume, I, I think, um, you know, it's definitely out there as an idea. Um, I think that the resume is more of like, um, I don't know the exact way I would describe it, but it's almost like that you have to have like at least like a minimum of like certain criteria met to be able to just like, uh, you know, the mission was accomplished of I did things uh, like I did enough things that it's justifiable to say, you know, I I, I made moves in the game uh, where if you have absolutely nothing, I don't know how if people are going to ever vote for you. But I do think that that likability part that you mentioned is I, I think maybe even is the most important part of this final tribal presentation. And in this like, uh, you know, final tribal council format, you do have a chance to sort of like interact with the jury one last time and really remind people like, uh, like, uh, you like me, you know, come on. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm likable. And, yeah. And, and, and use that likability to gain their respect, right. Uh, you know, get them to appreciate your game. And, and that's where I think some players in the modern era of survivor are, um, are maybe getting a little bit ahead of themselves where they feel like, okay, you know, for example, like Omer needs to go because nobody would ever be able to beat Omer or Lindsay needs to go because nobody will ever be able to beat Lindsay. Um, I think it's OK to also think about, OK, what if that's really like what if that's really dangerous for me? What if by taking out Omer or Lindsay or maybe high before them, like I become the big threat and now I'm in trouble. It's going to be harder for me to get to the end. You need to be able to at least consider the option of, okay, what about the route where I keep the big threat in the game, but I work overtime on making sure that I beat them in the end. I start thinking about my arguments against them right now. I start planting seeds in people, not to get them out, but to discredit them when it comes to the jury mm -hmm. phase, uh, the final tribal, uh, to get people to not like them as much or whatever it is, right? Um, yeah. I think people underestimate that there's game to be played there that I feel like we don't often see, you know, on screen, but uh, can be very effective. Yeah. And I feel like that, you know, we've seen this a little bit more in Big Brother and um, please like nobody take this as like a one for one. But, you know, when we think back to, you know, um, Josh and Paul in yeah. Big Brother uh, 19, where, you know, uh, and, you know, and Josh kind of like emerged at the end, you know, uh, like, uh, I mean, win a challenge. He like he won a challenge or two, um, but he went he went down to the end with Paul, but had been planting some seeds about like, uh, like, you know, to get people to know that, you know, it was Paul that was like betraying them. And was, you know, a likable enough person in the end uh, who ultimately got the votes. I, I, I don't think that Mike dominated the game in anywhere uh, near the way that uh, that uh, Paul did in uh, that season. And I think uh, Marianne had more going on throughout the course of the game uh, than Josh did at times. But like, I, I think it's a, a similar story. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I think that that's like when we think about, you know, seasons that potentially change the game, I do think that. Um, that Josh, for better or worse, did implement something intentionally or not that has definitely entered the uh, conversation with Big Brother for sure, uh, where this is this is a strategy that people now use. If you're not using this strategy for within Big Brother uh, of, you know, saying things in goodbye messages, then you're not really managing the jury to your optimum potential. Uh, in Survivor, that works a little differently. You don't have goodbye messages. 
Um, and you usually like the importance of blindsiding people is a little bit higher because you now have the shot in the dark and you have idols and you have all kinds of ways that people can turn it around on you. Uh, so that particular aspect is a little uh, different, but the idea that it's okay to potentially go to the end with somebody that is a big threat um, because you can still manage to beat them as long as you can out talk them at the end. And you, maybe if you put in some work, maybe you have an idol in your back pocket that you can show uh, if you can present it in the right way. Um, there are different ways of winning that don't always require voting somebody out. Yeah. You know, and in Survivor, I mean, um, this was a thing like back in like around when Russell went to the end and lost. Um, but then, um, you know, Boston Rob went to the end and won, but couldn't then coach went to the end and lost. It used to be more of a thing of like, OK, I'm going to bring this person to the end and the jury won't necessarily give it to them. But I feel like that it has been quite some time uh, since that has really been the thought on Survivor where we've had um, a jury who you know, um, ultimately was like uh, somewhat uh, punitive towards somebody on the jury. Am, am I missing anybody? Um, I, I don't I don't think so. I mean, you know, going back at least, you know, four seasons or so, I think that it's been a while since we've at least heard the narrative of like, oh, it was a bitter jury. Um, and, and I also just just don't get it twisted. I, I don't want to make it sound like th th this was a bitter jury. We're, we're talking about how Mike went in mm -hmm. as probably on paper um you know uh, a lot of people probably thought that mike was going was going to win and the jury had issues with mike's game that came up at the final tribal council and marianne really uh dazzled in the final tribal council yes and i i wouldn't say that this is a situation where mike lost so much as i, I think it was that marianne won like marianne overcame mike in the final stretch she had been sort of like uh like running behind him for a little while like leaving him out in front and then uh, did a sprint right in front of him before the finish line, kind of, uh, you know, and, and in a way she was actually ahead of him the whole time because she was always going to be able to do that. But, uh, but yes, um, I think that, uh, I think you have to be careful of this line of thinking as well. Like this isn't the end all be all. You can't just always rely on the final tribal or, um, you know, the, the things that you're doing, because this is sort of, a, a pitfall that I think a lot of people had in the Russell Hans area era where they were like, well, I'll take the Russell Hans then. Like I'll, I'll I will be the person that beats the the people that uh that they're bitter against, and then they go on to lose because people are mad at you for just bringing that person to the end and not doing anything. Like mm -hmm. you can't just be sitting there and be like, I think I'm gonna be in the end if I don't do anything. So I'm just gonna sit here and hope that my final tribal thing works out. You need to be planting seeds. You need to be actively doing things in the game so that you can prove to the jury in the end, because it's not just like ability and it's not just that the the jury is bitter or mad at the person next to you. It's also that you're able to win their respect. I think that's right. a, a key element of it. You and can't be looked at as an accomplice of the exactly. person who they are mad at. Exactly. You need to be separate from that person and respectable on your own right, um, in your own right. And and I think that's exactly what Marianne is able to do when, um, when she's able to... Uh, sell a narrative of her game that is separate from Mike's, separate from uh, Taku's in general. Um, this was my game. I was doing this. This is how I felt. Uh, and sells that narrative in an impressive way with the, with the passion. I think that's another huge element, the passion that she's selling it with, pulling out the idle surprises, change up how they view your game, you know, making small changes here or there, like, oh, you might have thought that this was happening, but actually something slightly different was happening. It's usually not enough. You need to really shake up, like, I had an idol this whole time, and then they're like, whoa, hold on. That changes my entire perception of your game. Now I'm going to start from scratch and and listen to what you're saying versus, like, you know, I had an idol this whole time and it didn't matter at all. Like, mm -hmm. the fact that Marianne got Mike to play the idol on her when she had an idol in her pocket, I think, is... The, is a huge part of why pulling out that idol made a huge impact on the jury. Yeah, I also I like what you said about uh, the passion uh, yeah. because that I think that we've seen in certainly in season 41 and season 42, like when the jury has you backpedaling, that's a that's a tough luck to overcome where we saw 
Marianne, uh, certainly like she was able to only, you know, uh, move the ball forward. Uh, she wasn't like going backwards or having to apologize for any of the things uh, that she did. I think that um, from Kevin in Big Brother Canada, another like a really uh, passionate final tribal council performance. I think that does a lot with the jury. For sure. Yes. And and I think I think what you mentioned about um, being on the back pedal is huge as well. Um, we did see an instance where Marianne had uh, Jonathan arguing with her about whether or not it was her move to take out Omer. Right. Um, and and I went into Final Tribal thinking this is one of the big things on her resume, that she is the one that pushed that move when Mike and Jonathan were too scared to do it. Right. Um, but when Jonathan pushes back, she kind of just goes, OK, she agrees and she moves on quickly because it's a losing game. Like mm -hmm. if Jonathan isn't going to admit or is capable of seeing that it wasn't his move and that it was her move or whatever it is, then she's never going to win with him and getting caught up in, in, in a back and forth where she's on the defensive trying to say like, no, 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 I did do this. I did do this. And somebody saying, no, you didn't. Uh, that's that's not a good look. So she quickly moved on from it and and went to other things, other backup plans for moves that she made. And I think that was a, another huge part of why she was able to be so effective in Final Tribal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and something bad that Mike did in the Final Tribal Council uh, when he came in and said, you know, I, I only told one lie in this game. Uh, like, I think that you never want to sort of like uh, quantify. I think he could just easily say, like, you know, um, you know, I, I, I tried to only lie when I had to, uh, would have been better. But when the fact when people are like, well, you lied to me, hold on. Was that a lie to me? And then he had to define what a lie was. And well, you had actually, you had actually gone against me. So it was, I, I thought I had a way out there. So I, I think that that was, uh, definitely the wrong foot to start on with this jury. Definitely. And I think that in, in general, um, for Mike, his story is already out there. He doesn't know everything about it, though. That's in, in self-awareness is something that, of, of course, is an obvious, like huge, huge benefit in a final tribal situation. Uh, Mike didn't have that for his game. He was unsure about different aspects of his game. And, and I think that even if you feel like you know what your game was, you should still try to be a little bit careful about the language mm -hmm. you use when describing it. Um, like for instance, and I think this is something that worked for Marianne, but I think it was risky when she explained the idol situation and how she guaranteed herself final three, she said, well, I knew that Jonathan would do this and Mike would do this and Omer would do this and Lindsay would do this. And that was like, that was a lot of different claims at once that any one of them could have been like, I wasn't going to do that. Mm -hmm. And then, and then that kind of shakes the whole thing. Now, luckily that didn't happen uh, because Marianne was spot on, but that is a riskier play that I, I would maybe hesitate to, uh, to do. I would just say I guaranteed me final three because of X, Y, and Z, like just more general reasons. Uh, but um, when Mike talks about like, Hey, I, uh, you know, I, I, I only lied once I played an honest game. I did this. When people are asking him questions that are like, do you think you played an honest game? Do you think you betrayed people? Like, why did you betray this person? And he's trying to justify those moves like, well, I didn't betray anybody until they betrayed me first. I didn't lie to anybody until they lied to me first. Like, Rockstar is the only person I actively sort of like, uh, you know, betrayed uh, preemptively, essentially. Uh, that's obviously no good. Sometimes, sometimes the people will be like, okay, yeah, that's kind of right. But sometimes... Uh, you know, you've got Omer on the jury saying, no, I tricked him into doing this. I lied to him mm -hmm. about high. Um, and so if I'm Mike, I think the, the, the thing I'm falling back on every time is I did what I had to do to get here because that's the one thing that they cannot disagree with. Right. Like I did. I, I'm I, like, uh, do you think you betrayed people to get to the end? Whether or not I think I did, I'm going to say, you know, at the end of the day, I did what I had to do to get myself sitting here in front of all of you. Um, and that's not like necessarily the best answer in the world, but it's at least not going to put you in the negative, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, they can't disagree that you are sitting there in the final three and that some in, the, in, in some ways the moves that you made got them there. Yeah. Or even like I came out here saying I was going to play this type of game. But as the game got more complicated, I had to, you know, make the decision to change up how I was playing the game. And I had to, you know, do things that I'm not proud of to, to get here. But that was the only way I could get past people like Hi and, uh, you know, uh, whoever's uh, sitting on the jury. 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, yeah, I think, th- I think that can work. I think maybe, maybe a little bit risky though, to, to proposition it as like, uh, like I wanted to play this way and then I found that I couldn't. Um, uh, well, I would say like, if you made it like an active decision of, I mm-hmm. had to decide to do a different thing of it's not like, Oh, it just slipped out. It just happened. <laughs> uh, I had to like, I, I, you know, analyze what was going on and made the decision to change my strategy at halftime and go and, and play the game a different way. Yeah. And I, and I think, I think if you go that route and I think in general that you should do this as well, uh, like whether it's, I did what I had to do or I made the decision at this point. Um, it, it's always because I looked at high and he was so smart and he was so good and everybody loved him. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to beat him. And I knew mm-hmm. that he was way too smart to like, uh, I couldn't wait. I knew it had to be sooner rather than later, because if I waited any longer, he would have caught on to me. And so I had to do it then. Um, you know, of course, you know, the, the typical sort of like pump them up, make them include them in the narrative, make them feel like they're like the worst part of the entire game for them. When they lost, it was part of a larger narrative where this person eventually wins. And it's because they were so good that they left. Tarrant, let's take a question from Sean Hartman, who says, what do you think is the biggest thing future players should take away from Marianne's winning game? I, I think I think the biggest thing is um, is is sort of what we just talked about, right? The um, the fact that she didn't need to be the big threat. Ever in the game, um, even even in the final three, people didn't see her as the big threat. And then she still won in in a dominating fashion um and that's because once they couldn't get rid of her she turned it on so well (laughs) that she wins the game so all of that jury management stuff uh is huge um but again it's it's sort of like i think it's interesting to look at omer versus marianne because omer was trying to run the game without people seeing that he was running the game whereas marianne was mostly just trying to survive until a certain point where she started to turn on a little more and she kind of just played the game in front of her um so it's not like she was intentionally trying to lie low uh until a certain point it was more that uh that was sort of like the cards that were dealt to her and she played as well as she could whereas omer was like trying to pretend to be a marianne while actually being the high or whoever it is that you know people think are running the game and for omer he ran out of runway it's at some point they caught on and they got rid of him uh with marianne she was able to basically peak at just the right time and like i said i don't think that she intentionally peaked at that time i think it was more that like opportunities were presented to her in a way where she was able to take those opportunities and run with them and make the most of them Mm-hmm. So uh, if you were to intentionally, if you were going to try to intentionally play a Marianne game, um, I think that's kind of difficult. Uh, I think you can't, you, I don't think you can go in and be like, okay, I'm going to be the Marianne. I'm just going to like lie low and be on the outs and be an option for somebody to vote out for a while and that, but be too likable to actually vote out. And then toward the end, I'm going to really kick it into gear because I've got an idol and I can do all these things. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a difficult game to replicate, I think. But the idea that you can be in that position and still be in a winning position, like say if you're somebody like Romeo um, and you are locked out, basically I think the thing to take away is if you are in a bad spot, there's still a lot of hope left. And don't don't give up that hope. Don't don't walk around feeling defeated. Don't like be thinking about what is my end game plan. If people are looking to bring me along for a while, what am I going to say in the end? What things can I do right now to give my story later, um, some, some evidence that I can use, uh, how can I interfere with different relationships? How can I build more relationships? Uh, all of those things I think are huge. And I think, I think those are the things that you should really look at when it comes to Marianne's game. I do want to add the caveat that Taryn and I are recording this before I've had the chance to start doing any of my deep dive interviews. And I have a couple uh, scheduled uh, in the next couple of days, including getting the chance to talk to Marianne more. So I will reserve the right to, you know, change up uh, what we're saying about Marianne. <laughs> yeah. If, uh, if new information comes to light. But I, I feel like that with Marianne, that she uh, really like w- came out there and really, you know, uh, 
let her freak flag fly of like, hey, I'm just here for fun. Like, you mm -hmm. know, uh, she says in her confessionals about how, hey, I'm here to win uh, it, it, early on. But I think that she really gave out vibes of, hey, I, I'm just a super fan. I'm here for I'm here for a good time. And, you know, I'm, you know, even like talking about Zach and, uh, you know, she, I think she did a lot of things that, that were just like, you know, just tried to like it was this was, you know, oh, this is so much fun. I'm here on Survivor. And I think that she really did play those things up intentionally at times, uh, especially at the merge. She talked about how she noticed that the players who were young and seemingly strategic were getting picked off. And so I think she was able to sort of like uh, ride that for a while and then. At the at the very end, she was able to convince people that like you thought I was here just for fun. I actually was playing the game the whole time. And I think that she benefited from being on a strong tribe from the pre-merge, uh, a cohesive tribe uh, in, in the pre-merge where, you know, Marianne knew she was on the bottom at Taku. But she wasn't like a Tory where she's like, I can't wait to get to the merge so I can flip on these idiots who they think they think I'm on the bottom. Wait until, you know, she was like, hey, I'm I'm, I'm going to stick with this group like she was like uh, just as much Taku strong as anybody. And that was the only group that didn't turn on itself at the merge. So I think that like an important thing from her free merge game is just because you're on the bottom of your tribe and you go into the merge, you don't have to be looking to flip uh, right away. Like there's there's room to play like from the bottom of the majority tribe. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and you know, I, I, in some ways, it's like, I feel like the advice I usually give, especially for brother, is advice that I think often would be better for television. I feel like the advice we're giving right now is maybe not, not the best for television, which is like, hey, if you're part of a majority and you're at the bottom, it's not the worst thing in the world to ride that for a little while. Uh, but, but the, you know. But just to add to that, um, would anybody say Miriam was not good television? I mean, uh, Very she, true. You, you don't have to be like, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm flipping every vote. Um, <laughs> you can just be, be good television, uh, like, uh, be your authentic self and, you know, bring a lot of energy to your confessionals, um, you know, bring a lot of energy to the camp life. Uh, and that's how, you know, Marianne, uh, like, uh, you know, got so much screen time in the season, uh, not because she was, you know, flipping. Yeah, and and I I think that that's that's a huge part of it as well. When you talk about like Marianne letting her freak flag fly, uh, like she is herself. I think that's another huge part of why it works for her to 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 play the way that she did and um and have such a dominating performance in the end is that nobody ever doubted that she was Marianne, um, and she didn't try to be anybody else. She didn't try to play as anybody else. Uh, she toned down the strategic aspects of herself in order to maintain a certain level of, you know, low level of threat. Um, but she was very unapologetically who she was. Uh, and she, whether that hurt her in the game or helped her in the game, she didn't, um, she didn't change who she was for the sake of the of fitting in or anything like that. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's huge. I think, and again, that comes to, down to self-awareness, knowing who you are going into the game um, and not trying to, to just like completely pretend to be somebody else entirely. And, and again, like th it, there's a difference between like, I'm a really strategic person and I'm going to pretend I'm not. And like, Hey, I'm, you know, Marianne and I think Zach's cute. Uh, but I'm going to, I'm going to keep that. I'm going to not be too weird because I don't want people to be weirded out by me. Uh, like that's what I think you need to avoid doing. I think a lot of people tone them, their own personality down. I think Jonathan is a great example of this, right? Where Jonathan talked constantly about how, well, my personality, I'm too intense, uh, for people and, you know, my size and stuff, I've got to act a certain way or else people will think I'm this or that. Um, it just doesn't work. At some point, you come out. You can't. You can't hide who you are. Uh, and uh, and with Jonathan, it seems like that happened, right? Like he mm -hmm. was constantly talking. I, I can't complain too much because they'll be mad at me. And then we're seeing constant scenes of him complaining way too much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And and him trying to not complain seems to only make it worse. Uh, and it's just like this is not working. Um, and I think it obviously helps if your personality is, is one that is likable. Uh, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, you just have to be yourself and be genuine about who you are while being not as genuine about the strategic decisions that you're making. I think that's huge.
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I would say it's not just true in Survivor. Uh, you know, these podcasts are not just for people who are going to play Survivor one day, but I think that they're true uh, in life also that I know that, you know, uh, Taryn and I have, you know, uh, seen so many uh, up and coming podcasters uh, come through in talking with us. And I think the people that like have really like broken out uh, as like podcasters and people who have sort of like caught on with the audience immediately are not the people that are sort of like doing an impression of what you think a good podcaster is supposed to be. I think the people that have been, you know, more of their authentic selves on a podcast and sort of like, uh, you know, let us see a little bit of their weirdness, I think are the people that have really uh, always connected with the audience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, because at the end of the day, and anybody can try to be like the most neutral, agreeable person in the world. Uh, and lots of people do. And so you see the same thing over and over. And you're, that's just kind of boring. People want to see who you are. They want to feel like they can relate to you um, because most people aren't neutral, boring, no opinion people. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so, uh, and so that in this, in the, you know, again, it applies to survivor in the sense that like, if you're never giving any opinions, if you're never, um, you know, trying to lead anything uh, or even just like be a part of anything, you know, you, cause you're just like, nah, I like this person. And I also like this person. And I also like this person. Uh, you know, we're all fine. Um, like if that's who you are and you're just like, man, it's all about love, man. Like that's fine. Cause that's who you are. Right. But, uh, but if, if it's clear, if you're like, uh, if you're like giving eye rolls to yourself every time you look at somebody and then somebody comes up to you, you're like, so Jonathan, eh? And you're like, nah, he's great. What are you talking about? Uh, mm -hmm. then you'd be like, okay, this person's lying to me. It's, uh, I, I can't, I can't connect to this person at all. Let's take one from baby Andy. Um, the great baby Andy says challenge ability did not play a major factor in either Erica or Marianne's win. Uh, we've seen Ricard and Lindsay get targeted for their individual challenge ability. And Jonathan uh, did not get jury respect, even though he was dominant in the pre-merge. How uh, in the new era, uh, how important is it to be good at challenges, especially as it compares to Big Brother, where we've seen it becomes more important over time. Karen, how big of a deal is success in the challenges in the new era of Survivor? I think it's becoming less of a big deal. Uh, you know, I think it comes in waves, but, um, you know, we, I think sort of like the, the peak of it is probably like the Mike Holloway, right? Um, where it's like, well, I got to give it to him. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like that doesn't exist as much anymore where it's it's like, and I, I think a big part of it too is, is, it's not just about the challenges on Survivor, at least. It's also, did the challenges matter? Uh, like, if Jonathan runs the table on all the immunity challenges up until the final three, uh, does he get votes? Probably not, because he wasn't the target anyway. He probably didn't need those challenges because nobody was threatened by him. If Jonathan is the target, if he is what I think maybe, you know, he thought he was or some other people thought he was, where it's like mm -hmm. he is obviously going to win if he gets to the end and then he wins every challenge and nobody can vote him nobody has a chance to vote him out then he's got a great case like uh they couldn't do it they tried they wanted to but they couldn't um that's a that's always a great case but even that case i think is a little bit uh less effective in the current era of survivor because there are so many people who are coming into the game with different perspectives and uh who are bigger fans of the show and they want to see a more well-rounded uh, person win the game. Somebody who is, uh, you know, being able to, uh, who, is, who is able to strategize and communicate effectively um, and isn't just like out there, you know, beasting challenges. So um, I don't think challenges matter as much, especially in Survivor, you know, if we're comparing to Big Brother. In Big Brother, challenges give you power mm -hmm. and that can change the perception of you uh, by the other players in survivor it's just giving you immunity you don't really have power over anybody else except for like the final four immunity where you can choose one person but even then it's it, it, it your your power is immediately undermined by the fact that it's then the two remaining people um you know winning themselves to the end uh so it doesn't seem like you have that much power yeah i don't think that um, winning the challenges uh, really matters all that much in Survivor these days, especially in the post-merge. I think the only exception is when a person needed it. I mean, it's really, I, I think that's sort of like the challenges are like properly rated. I mean, that's, that, that's the idea of 
you know, uh, what it what it was there for, where, OK, if you feel like you are going to go home tonight, win this challenge and you and you will be safe. And I think that in these two seasons, probably Ricard was the person who probably benefited the most from like that. There were times where his back was against the wall, that there was a chance that he was going to go. Uh, he was able to, you know, uh, win some immunities. Correct. Does that sound right? Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. He won a couple of immunities. And Final six. I think he won. Uh, he, he won an immunity also. So there were times where, you know, he was a potential person to go home. Uh, he won immunities. And I think that people like I remember Danny giving him credit of like, uh, you know, you all thought you were going to beat this man today. Uh, like, uh, you know, um, I, I took it seriously. And, you know, that's why I said we should have got him out last time. So I, I think in that case, like it has it has helped. Um, but in season 42, I think that it what was impressive was that I think that Lindsay was beating Jonathan to win to win those immunities. But I feel like that had Jonathan not been there, I don't know if people would have looked at what Lindsay was doing as like uber impressive. Yeah, I I, I think I, I agree with that. And um and I think that I mean this is this is something that I've I've talked about for a little while, but I do think there is some validity to the strategy of intentionally putting a target on your back. It's, it's sort of the opposite of what I've been talking about, where it's like, you don't need a target on your back. You don't need to be the big threat in order to win at the end. But if you feel like your case is very bad uh, to win the game, or you're worried about, you know, trying to out talk somebody who's a very good talker and is probably going to be there. Um, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world to like intentionally try and like proclaim that you made a big, big move or like get a target. on Like say you have an idol in your pocket. It's good to five. Um, get the votes on you intentionally at five so that you okay. can play the idol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Negate the votes and be like, whoa, he survived. And then now you just need to either win final four immunity or fire. Mm -hmm. And uh and, and and you're in final three. And it's like they tried. They tried to get me out because they knew I was the big threat. They knew I was the big target, but I I I blocked them at every turn. Um, like that's not the worst Hail Mary in the world if you're sitting there at final. I six. thought Marianne might have done that in this season where we coming into that final five episode. I was like, oh, mm -hmm. wait, watch this now. You know, you thought that move was big. Wait until it is, is Marianne potentially going to try to get votes on herself there so she could be, you know, cast the sole vote to go home. Uh, did not seem like that was on her mind. No, but she could have used her idol on Lindsay um, to do mm -hmm. something similar uh, where it's like, hey, I just got Mike to yeah. use an idol on me, then turned around and messed with his right. plans. I'm the big target. Now. I mean, Romeo like attempted to do this with the fake idol. It's like, uh, just yeah. so you know, fake idol, you know. Um. Yeah. <laughs> and I respect the attempt. Unfortunately, like it just didn't it just didn't play uh, because it wasn't real and he didn't need it. So it was like, you know, like I don't think anybody anybody on the jury was like, oh, man, they were about to vote for Romeo, if not for that fake immunity idol. Uh, you know, maybe if they had been, maybe if they'd been talking about it, like you know, if he could craft some kind of narrative where it mattered that he had that fake idol. Um, but the problem is that at that point, the, the respect level for his game was so low that it, it just wasn't working. Um, so he needed to build something ahead of time to, to, to make that work. And it just didn't. Okay. Um, this is a question from Ricky who says, and in the new 26 day season, if you find yourself at the bottom post merge, uh, what are the new strategies that players should use to play from the bottom during these quicker games? How could Romeo have played, uh, from his position better? Um, I think it's a little interesting and I had been making the comparison uh, between uh, Survivor and Big Brother where I, I think that, you know, for Marianne, had this been a Big Brother season, I, I'm not sure if Marianne could have like come from the deficit that she was at to go from like where she was at the final six to ultimately come out of that Omer vote in such a like a great position. I feel like that uh, we don't see those types of swings happen normally in uh, big brother and you know stop me if you disagree uh for romeo I, I feel like that he's somebody who you know was just you know got into an untenable position and there was just no way out for him to get into a winning spot after a certain point that's how it felt and it's hard to talk about because i feel like we didn't see why um, mm -hmm. and, and that's uh, something I'm sure was talked about a lot during the season, but like basically when the merge hit, everyone was like, nah, Romeo sucks. He's paranoid. We don't like mm -hmm. him anymore. And like, uh, okay. Um, is something happened there socially where 
it things just weren't clicking for other people apparently and uh and because of that you know we talked about likability when it comes to that final tribal situation winning the respect of uh of the jurors it's a lot harder to do that if they don't like you very much because they don't have a lot of incentive to respect you um and so if people didn't respect you or particularly like you through most of the the game they're not just going to like turn around and both like you and respect you out of nowhere um and so you know i think that for for romeo it was it was about just focusing on social bonds more uh i think that my my guess for what he was doing throughout most of the merge portion of the game is that he was pre presenting himself as a, a free agent um you know come to me for a vote if you need one I'll, i'm willing to vote wherever you need me to go uh i'm gonna have like individual strategic relationships with people which is great it kind of probably helped keep him afloat for a little while but it didn't seem like those relationships were very personal um that he wasn't really bonding with people too much uh the one time we did see him bond with high it didn't seem to really go anywhere and then they got into a fight um and it was like who like who out there really stuck up for romeo cared about romeo it didn't seem like that existed and uh that's sort of like the foundation that you need to start with to start building anything else so i think that's what he probably needed to focus on maybe he tried and it just didn't work yeah i think that you have to look at Romeo sort of like in conjunction with uh, Marianne also, who were two of the players who were considered on the bottom through most of the post merge. But I think that with Marianne, it was like, oh, don't worry about Marianne. She's harmless. You know, uh, Marianne, you know, she's just here for fun. She can be in these conversations uh, if if we want her to. But, you know, nobody talked to Romeo because Romeo that he's he's scheming. Just don't, don't give him anything, freeze him out. And I think that he was looked at somebody who, you know, he's on he's on the bottom and, you know, we can't even tell him the right person to vote for because we know he's going to go and tell people where he just like was in a position. And, and it's so interesting because it, it, this almost never happens in Survivor where somebody's in such a good position coming into the merge and then all, like has, a, you know, tight allies and then basically is just like frozen out when they get to the merge. And I don't think he knew how to handle that in the first couple of days of the merge. Yeah, and I and I think that maybe he ended up jumping the gun a little bit, um, trying to make bigger plays without that foundational support, um, and that's what really like sunk him even further. Whereas we talk about Marianne intentionally playing down her strategic side, playing up the social, you know, goofball side. Um, you know, Romeo is like the second he got a scrap, he tried to he like he bet it all on black, um, and it was like whoa. Like, uh, like, no, it's uh, like he ran and tried to make a plan like I got to get Jonathan out or like whatever. Right. Um, or like, the, you know, he used every single little bit that he had to try to strategically maneuver, including his vote where he would vote, you know, cast rogue votes and then blame it on people or deny it. Um, and it was like, like, you don't have enough to actually be betting here. Uh, mm -hmm. You need to build up your your uh, your, you know your pot first um in order to to get there but um and so when he's constantly failing with these scraps you're like i can't even give him scraps uh you gotta you gotta show that you, that people can trust you to give you those scraps and then then you start to hoard them and then eventually you've got something to play with like this exactly what marianne did yeah and in his exit interview he talked about how uh you know he was uh seen as like uh talking to tori um or that one of the things uh that was like he had said was that him and drea said okay well let's try to downplay how close we are and it's almost like that thing where it's like hey we're gonna pretend this and then like the thing that you're pretending like ultimately happens uh because it feels too real and because he was talking to tori too much romeo had said that dre is like why is he talking to tori that's my nemesis so that he sort of got like the tori stink on him from being like too close with tori and talking to her too much at the merge and i think that he was looked at as sort of like from a, a different lens the rest of the way yeah yeah that's always uh that's always a, a tricky thing but um you know I, there were other people like marianne was able to talk to tori uh and got away with it right um so i think it's just a matter of um you know being able to actually hide that sort of thing uh is is the key there okay let's take a question from ben from st louis um Hey, Rob, now that hindsight is 2020, I can't stop thinking about the Mariah boot episode. Omer made the decision to keep Marianne very similar to, to Shan's decision to keep Ricard over Jeannie in Marianne's win and Ricard's deep run in 41. Uh, that is that proof that keeping the strategic super fan over the loyal player is a huge mistake 
or is there merit to having a strategic partner at the merge? Okay, so ultimately, um, you know, Shan is going to keep her card. I, I think it's a little different in the case of Omer. With I think that Marianne was uh, like another option um, that you know it's presented in the show for Omer that Jonathan is an is a close number. Uh, we saw the close relationship that Omer and Lindsay have in the game. I'm not sure how tight necessarily Omer and Marianne were as strategic partners at that point in the game. So I think it's a it's a little bit different, but interesting question. Yeah, I mean, it's always there's always the dilemma here is um, there's a player who and I don't we don't really know how uh, Mariah would have played um, because we didn't see much of her, but. Uh, the idea of a player who would just be a loyal number would never consider wavering would just be, you know, locked in with you versus um, somebody like Marianne, who is a little bit more of a wild card. They could flip if they feel like it benefits them. Um, but at the same time, you know, they are going to be more willing to make moves with you and, uh, be a little bit, uh, you know, sneaky with you if you need, if you need that, um, Whereas somebody that's entirely based on like a personal connection, if they catch you being sketchy, uh, they might really just hard bounce off of you and never work with you again. Um, and at the same time, if they bond with somebody else even stronger, then now you're now you've lost them. Uh, so it's I think it's you really have to be able to know, and I'm sure it's really hard to know if, after only a couple of days how bonded to this person you are. Because in my eyes, there's there's very few things that are as valuable as just a, a complete lock loyal player to you. Um, yeah. And so in that sense, I would definitely be inclined to keep that loyal player, but you have to make sure it's to you and not to anybody else. And you mm -hmm. have to make sure that, uh, that also like the, the, the flip side of the, the double edged sword aspect of it is if they're so not strategically inclined that they won't understand you trying to make it seem like you're not that close to them. <laughs> like, are you going to be able to hold on to them without being an obvious pair, which kind of like for somebody like Omer, who was really trying to lie low, um, would really make him st stand out if it's like, well, Omer's got Mariah and this, so, uh, what's going on there. Mm -hmm. So you really have to pay attention to that. I think uh, if I were to guess what Omer was thinking, um, I would guess that he felt like he could just work with, with Marianne more. And, and I think there are some huge uh, positives to that, that somebody like Marianne, I think, is still a social player, still somebody who works on loyalty. I don't think Marianne is going to betray somebody easily. Uh, I think that it, it took a little bit for her to turn on Omer like she did, um, but also is going to be much more willing to like work with you on some tricky votes. Like, hey, we need Jonathan out. How is Mariah going to feel about that? What? I thought we were Taku strong. What are you doing? Yeah. Um, right. So. Yeah, there, there are there are pluses and minuses. I think that you really need to evaluate the situation that you're in. Um, but uh, I think honestly, either either way, depending on what you're going to do. Yeah, I think the two situations are a little bit different. Uh, I'm not sure exactly who Mariah might have felt the most loyalty to. Uh, perhaps it was Jackson. Um, I'm not sure if she was sort of like a person who was maybe a little. They looked at her as loyal, but I don't know if she necessarily had like a tight confidant in that group uh, where Marianne was a little bit more of like the rah, rah, like a uh, Taku four person. Um, but also that um, in the case, in the other case where Jeannie like has sort of like sworn allegiance to Shan that I think that Shan or Jeannie was a person that was never going to betray uh, Shan and where she wanted to go. So that to me seems like the bigger misstep to uh, keep Ricard and ultimately uh, get rid of Jeannie in that spot. I was going to say also that both of them, uh, this was a case of like in both cases, proximity to an advantage uh, was was kept. But uh, I had just gone back and rewatched those episodes. They didn't know going into that tribal council that uh, Marianne had the extra vote yet. When they come back from the tribal council where Mariah, uh, maybe Marianne like might have uh, alluded to the fact that she had an advantage. Um, but she doesn't know for sure she has an extra vote until they come back from that tribal council. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I, I think uh, I think the the point point about Ricard and Jeannie as well is is solid because, like in that situation, I don't think Shan needed a Ricard. 
Um, mm-hmm. I think that she was carrying him socially uh, into the merge. Uh, she already had other options. And uh, and so I think for her, just having somebody that was like block loyal um, would have been much more valuable than somebody that she could like strategically maneuver with, because I think she already got to that point at that point in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, but he had so, that extra vote like he was like, I'm going to hold on to this until the tribal council. So it would have been like also like for her flushing away that advantage uh, that she had gotten from J.D. Which is true. Like, I get that. But, but genie is a literal extra vote every yeah round. like yeah, and yeah. how often do you really i know that it was used to affect this season but like the the times in which an extra vote have really come into play are pretty rare so mm-hmm. um i for me i'm i'm willing to give up an extra vote in order to uh to win to get like a, a loyal player on 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 board right, heading into a merge Taryn, let me bring in a question from uh, the great Greg Dunlap, who says something that we've seen for two seasons now is the dominance of smaller voting groups, uh, be they tribes or twists in the post merge. Uh, We started with three tribes and uh, never swapped to two. And in the post merge, I think we only had one completely normal full cast vote between the double elimination the hourglass, et cetera, et cetera. I, I will say that uh, I think we, we also had normal votes at six and five also uh, as, as well. Um, Jeff had mentioned now uh, that he really likes the small groups and wants to see them more uh, in the future. How does this focus on smaller group dynamics change things for players who are interested in playing in future seasons? So uh, again, just to clarify uh, that there were, it was a normal vote at 11, eight, six, and five. Uh, those were the only normal votes uh from you know from the final 12 on um do you have any thoughts on the effect of smaller groups in survivor here uh i mean i think i agree with jeff i like them um in terms of how they shake up the structure of the game i mean uh you know something that i was thinking about is like well when is the last time we had a paganging in survivor Right. Like, Mm -hmm. I feel like I don't even hear that term much anymore. Uh, It's and I think it's in large part because of, you know, a the new meta game uh, where you don't stick with one group. You you chop down the heads that poke up. Um, But another part of it is, you know, the different swapping and uh, the way that, you know, things are being shaken up by the uh, the merge votes. I love the idea of splitting the, the tribe into smaller groups because if it's a somewhat regular thing, what it means is you need to be prepared for that kind of vote. You need to not only be secure in your numbers, but you need to be secure with the people who are not in your group because you might end up uh, locked in a position where you're relying on some of those other relationships. And uh, and that's interesting to me. That means that there's much more to be doing in the game other than just, you know, locking down six people and saying all right we've got a buddy system uh like uh like could you imagine in redemption island if this twist were in play and then rob gets stuck with you know five uh zapateras or whatever um Mm -hmm. like uh uh-oh right now he's now in order to prep for that he's got to actually work on his relationship with those people as well uh and so i think that makes the game more interesting and i think that's the, the 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 solve for it as well which is um it's more like Big Brother in this way. In in Big Brother, any one person can win HOH and nominate two other people and force everybody else to vote between those two people, which means you need to be good with as many people as possible because any one of them can win that power. Um, same is kind of true in Survivor where you might get stuck in a group with people that might you might be relying on their votes. So you need to be playing that kind of more Omer style of game if you're playing his style of game, which is connecting with as many people as possible, having as many options as possible. Different uh, different groups mean, okay, in this group, I'm going to go with uh, Tori and Romeo, and now we've got three of five. Um, and in this group, I've got Hi and Mike and Jonathan, we got four or five. Um, that's great. Or, you know, similar to Marianne's strategy, in any group, I'm not the biggest threat. That's riskier because you never fully know and there might be people that are grouped up there, but it's still like the chances of you being targeted a little bit smaller if you're not as much of a threat. So um, I like what it does to the game and I think it just means that you need more backup plans, more doing, be doing more work, creating more relationships, all of those things. 
the thing that I don't like about the smaller tribes is that I feel like that for players who are sort of like in the early game where it's just basically once if there's a decision made, okay, it's you. I feel like there's the shot in the dark now, but alternative to that, you don't have a lot of options where I feel like that, you know, tribe of eight, tribe of nine, even 10, you know, you have a lot of different ways that you could potentially play uh, the first couple of votes. It's, it's very true. Um, and I, and I feel like, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's important that not every vote is like that. I think having one vote here or there. Um, and I think that also establishing the merge dynamic first, right? Like a regular merge vote or two, and then maybe shake it up once, once there's already been, you know, a, a group mm-hmm. uh, established. Um, because yeah, you're right. I think that the problem with it is that once you do get into those smaller groups, you're probably locked it. Like, it's like, okay, this is how it's going to play out based on this group. Uh, mm-hmm. There's one person that can be targeted and if they don't win immunity, then they're out. Um, yeah. And, and that's, it's a little bit more likely to be like that, but, um, but I do think it, 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 it is kind of fun to shake things up a little bit. Yeah. Th- that also being said, I really don't like big tribes at the merge. So I kind of like what they've done with the six and six, uh, you know, barring like how they've executed it on the hourglass. But I do feel like that they did correct something that I thought was bad in, you know, modern day survivor where we get a 13 person merge and all right, get ready for, you know, an 11 to two vote coming up at the merge where it's just like, okay, who's the easiest person to decide? Okay. It's, it's not even like the biggest three threat it's like okay who's the you know the who's the person here that nobody likes all right pick them off at the merge and we get like a very lopsided uh merge vote if anything i'm wondering if maybe we should instead of like go through the whole hourglass situation of you get to 12 why don't we go into back to two tribes of six yeah two tribes of six and get it to and and merge at 10 and then and then don't do and then don't you know split up again at 10 yeah, I, I think I think that's interesting. Um, you know, I, I think that although I, I will say I think that like it, once you go back down to two, uh, I guess I, I you'd hope at that point that the, the lines are blurred enough that like those in those tribes don't last long enough that they wouldn't like really stick together. Mm-hmm. But uh, I definitely think there'd be for, like if I was playing, I would very I'd push as hard as possible. Like if we get the numbers advantage uh, on a six, six and we go into the merge at like six, four um i'm gonna be like that's it we're final six easy uh right yeah but i feel like that especially with this accelerated time frame of Mm -hmm. like these like are you with this group for three days like is that enough time that you're gonna like you've made bonds that's going to really like uh keep you together for, for the whole game like it's not like that you know you've you know spent you know, six or seven days together, you know, if it's, mm-hmm. if it's that quick and you're back with, you know, you're coming from a, a you know, a tribe of six, maybe uh, best case scenario, there's three people from your original tribe. I'm not sure how like set in stone uh, that is. If you um, end up on this new tribe of six, I think it's worth experimenting with. Yeah. I, I like <laughs> that better because the hourglass is trash. Oh, and yeah. So, I mean, uh, anything but the hourglass. But basically, do the whole thing. You're like, okay, we get to the merge. Okay, we're gonna divide you into two groups of six. Okay, somebody's gonna like a like they'll they'll be a big feast. Man, maybe it's not the merge feast, but you know, okay, six of you are gonna go to Applebee's and whatever. Um, and then you know you're immune. That group, they 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 might have a tribal council that night. You know, it's like okay, a, a quick tribal council, and then maybe. You know, one more, one more tribal council. And now you have ten. I think that's a much more fair way to do it than you know what whatever this was in forty one and forty two. Yeah. Okay. All right. John, John P wants to know: Is running the merge a good thing anymore? Will we ever see another alliance run the merge and win the game, or is the crumbling inevitable in the new era? This is like what you're talking about with uh, Pagangi. Taku did dominate the post merge game. Yes. Uh, Although ironically, only one of the four Taku. Uh, it, it's interesting, right? Like they they get yeah. to the final six. There's four of them. One that the they they do three of those four bad. were in the majority alliance. The yeah. one that wasn't is the one that won. <laughs> yeah, they do as bad as possible from the final six out, and ultimately, uh, you know, uh, the person on the bottom and then the two people who are non Taku get to the final three. Yes. Um. Yeah. I mean, I think that. It's it, being in the majority. It, it, it's interesting because in Survivor, being in the majority used to be 
even more solid than it was in, say, Big Brother, where, you know, the majority, it matters. But again, anybody outside of the majority could still win and put you in, in danger. Whereas in Survivor, if you have a majority and you lock that in, you can't be stopped. Uh, like it's like it's very difficult for somebody to take somebody out from the majority if the majority stays solid. Um, but uh, we're now seeing in Survivor that it's actually easy to overcome them, easier to overcome the majority than in Big Brother lately because of the new meta of the game. I think primarily where it's like, look, I need to make sure that I'm going down in a winning position, and this majority is too big. If it's a majority of seven. That, that only gets me to seven. Uh, seven is not enough, um, you know, like, because in a weird way, and, you know, I'm pretty critical of the fire making thing. And I don't love it. Uh, I also don't like the final three. But what it does do is it kind of forces you to make moves even earlier. Um, because if you wait until final seven or final six to make your move, it might be too late. It's very easily, you know, Immunity, idol, fire, nothing you can do, mm -hmm. uh, right? There's just a couple of rounds to make that move. It's there's too much there's a, too much lack of control in those final few rounds. Uh, so you need to make those moves earlier, and that I think inhibits a majority's ability to stay a majority for a long period of time. Uh, so, is it important to uh, to be in control? I mean, I would still prefer to be in the majority come the merge. Uh, I don't need to be running the majority in the merge. Um, I, I would very happily, especially if it's a 12 person merge, give it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, they can, they can be in charge. They can run things. I'll let them run things for a while, as long as they're not taking out like my allies. Uh, and I think that's a huge part of how Taku, you know, dominated in, in the season up until a point, which yeah. is that they kept their Marianne around. Like they, they kept their pieces around. High lost his, uh, Drea lost hers, kind of gave it up, I guess. Uh, and, um, and, you know, even then like, like, uh, other people, like Roxroy left, like people were just losing their, their allies and allowing the other people to continue to build theirs, which is yeah. why you ultimately see, um, you know, Omer in the position that he ultimately becomes to, and, and, and Lindsay also like in a good position to win. And then Marianne ultimately does win. Um, so I think that's big. Like you don't need to be in charge, but also don't be losing. Yeah. I think that just looking at these two seasons, like I'm wondering if like sort of the unified theory that we sort of like uh, touched on earlier is like the ideal positioning in survivor as being be at the bottom of the majority. Yeah. That's at like the, right where you want to be. Yeah. At the bottom of the majority to the extent that people aren't even bothering to take out your people to weaken you because you're mm -hmm. already weak. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then when people yeah. take out the the people who are at the top of the majority, you know, you are like in a really good position to like fall in and be at the bottom of, you know, that new majority. Yes. I think the, like being at the, the bottom of the majority is great until you get to a point where that majority starts picking off your allies. That's when you need to start changing things um, mm. in my eyes, uh, because I think that high loses the game when 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 Lydia leaves. I think yes. that um, I think that like Mike to some degree, uh, Jonathan, like these these dudes, they start to lose the game when Rockstroy leaves, um, and uh, and so it's it's important to make sure that your pieces stay intact because if you wait too long and you've lost all your allies and then the shot gets taken at the big dogs, you don't have any pieces to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Like okay, you've moved up a notch, but now there's just too many people still in front of you. Um, uh, you know, and it's it's fine if you're able to make new connections and, and new allies. That's that's okay. It's fine to lose one in order to gain another, but um, but you need to make sure that you're still in a, a good position. I think. Okay, uh, and then uh, off of that, Dan Sadensky wants to know how can someone make moves in the mid merge and make it to the end. You know, I I really I feel like Omer is a great example of how to play the mastermind version of the modern era of survivor mm -hmm. um obviously marianne is the one that that wins the game um but uh she didn't didn't win the game in like the sort of like i controlled everything i was the mastermind i drove every vote kind of way um she won in a very impressive different kind of way um and again you need to make sure you know who you are and the kind of game that you're yeah. apt to play but 
Um, but ultimately, I think Omer came very close and he kind of maybe tripped up at the, the finish line a little bit. Um, yeah. Well, here's my question, Taryn. Um, was Omer's plan ever going to work? Because I, I know Omer has talked a little bit about how uh, things at, once he got to Ponderosa, uh, that there was a bit of an icy reception uh, for him, which, you know, uh, leads us to believe that if he got to the final three, that he could have easily gotten the same reception uh, that Mike got from the jury. I think that's fair. Um, but I think that I think that that's just true of just how you manage the jury. Like, I think that um, I think it, it matters what kind of jury you have. And I think it matters how you manage them. Um, you know, we have seen players like Boston Rob win and lose playing a very similar style of game. Right. Uh, and it just it just depends on who's there and, and how you manage them. Um, you know, Kim wins in dramatic fashion, playing a very dominant style of game. Uh, and then, you know, uh, Russell Hans loses, right? I'm not comparing the two in strategically, mm -hmm. but uh, but in terms of that style of game, I do think it can win. Um, so, and I think this style of game is, is, is the same. I think that uh, it is a trickier game to manage because uh, of its unique properties of the point of it being, I'm staying under the radar. I'm not, people don't see what I'm doing. Um, you know, the Kims and the Boston Robs, everybody sees what they're doing, but they can't do anything about it, which makes it easy to sell their case, but people might be mad at them. Um, in Omer's case, it was, I need them to see and then also not be mad at me. That's a I need to accomplish two things. Um, and I think that we just saw somebody accomplish this in Big Brother, um, where they were playing a very under the radar game to the point where even at the end, they didn't know they, that this person was going to win because they had done such a good job of managing people on their way out um, that it turns out they were all rooting for this person. So uh, I think there is a way to do it. Uh, could Omer have pulled it off? I don't know. I don't really know what was in the minds of the mm -hmm. jury. But I do think that Omer would have performed better than Mike in Final Tribal. I think he would have owned his moves. I think he would have said like, you know, I think you would have said I did what I had to do. Um, you know, I was behind these moves. I I made this call and I made this call and I was absolutely I was the um, you know the the hidden emu of the season. Like I like uh, like uh, he would have got he would have compared himself to an animal. It would have been great. Um, so I do I do think that you can win with this okay. style of play. We've talked a lot about what the players need to take away, and I know this isn't exactly what the show is, but Taryn, I always like to hear what you think about sort of like the production design of the game in terms of like the way that they have all of these uh, game mechanics play out for the players and what sort of environment that creates for the players. What do you think are the biggest things that the Survivor production needs to address uh, for this upcoming year of Survivor? I mean, I think the big ones, like the hourglass that nobody likes. I think the, the do or die, which I always confuse with shot in the dark. Mm -hmm. um but do or die is is just terrible because if we ever get to a point where somebody dies yeah what kind of ending of an episode is that like that's not like uh, you picked the wrong box no oh. vote guys uh just they're out like mm -hmm. uh, oh okay <laughs> Uh, I think that like their best case scenario is that they portray it like oh the fan favorite is gonna be voted out unless this person dies and they died and they're like, okay, thank you. You know, the Marianne of the season didn't give out or whatever it is. But, um, but that's just, it's just, it's just a bad spot to put yourself in. Uh, I've talked about this before. Um, so I think those are the two big, huge things that they, uh, that they need to address. Um, what about anything else that's sort of, um, you know, n not the obvious stuff, not the obvious stuff. Um, I, okay. The final three is also obvious. Fire making, yeah, I think is well, also obvious. Yeah, just because you want to see a vote in that spot, or is there any other uh, reason? In I just think a final two is so much better. I, when has the, when has a final three ever made a difference other than like Ghost Island? You know, like uh, well, because she has. The I've said vote. that they should like the jury should just vote out the person at the final three. It's like, all right, jury, you have like a little bit of power tonight. Okay, who is like uh, you know cast your vote for the person like uh, like uh, who has no shot to win the game. 
you know, uh, and basically yeah. like, isn't it, is that any different than, you know, the zero vote finalists? Like has the zero vote, has anybody ever come in as like the zero vote finalists? Maybe Natalie White, uh, who then like turned the whole thing around. Yeah. I, I yeah, I guess so. Like, yeah. Put them I, on I think, the jury. You made it this far. Like, I, cause I enjoyed Romeo's performance at the final, at the final tribal. I, I liked hearing what he had to say for sure, but it didn't feel like it fit in the episode. Uh, like that to me, that was Romeo's like interview with you, uh, mm-hmm. after the, like, it didn't make any difference. It, it, it was like, uh, like this is clearly a battle between Mike and, and Marianne. Why are we spending so much time on Romeo when he's obviously not going to win, which again is, is not shade to Romeo. It's just the position that he was in. Um, so if he was voted out prior to that, I think that would make for better television. It's just always been more epic to me to have two people facing off in the end um and i also think that uh it's more interesting game wise uh you know when i think about some of like the biggest moments in survivor uh some of like the biggest most impressive moves like kagian would have been a much worse season in my eyes if it had been a final three um Mm -hmm. you know to not get tony getting woo to take him uh would have been a huge loss to uh survivor history so um you know i i want those moments to exist for that purpose i also find the fire making to be very boring um most of the time so i don't want to see that but for whatever reason they like these things um i think they've done a good job though in terms of encouraging the kind of gameplay that we're seeing where people are making moves left and right and the the idea of a resume i think is beneficial to the television producers because it is going to prevent people from being stagnant um and they're going to want to make moves they're going to want to uh to do these things um and for as many advantages as there are in the game i think it's been like years since we've actually seen an idol used effectively right uh so i think that like they've actually done a pretty decent job in that sense and i think that they've also done something interesting with omer's advantage he had an idol nullifier that was ne- that never even made the show um i think for as much as that like limits our information uh watching the show i'm kind of okay with it like that like we don't need to be cluttered up with another whole thing if it never ends up mattering now i think it did maybe end up a little bit mattering but uh you know so i don't love that but like it you know you can add as many advantages if you want if they don't end up mattering just don't don't bother to show them i think that's fine too for the most part i so overall i do like the direction that the season that the the show has gone in in the last two seasons i think that they're experimenting with a lot of things i think a lot of them worked i think uh, a few of them really did not and i hope that they ditch the things that didn't and continue with the things that did personally yeah, I feel like a few of the things also like uh, they got lucky with how they worked. And I yeah. don't know if uh, necessarily uh, they took the right lessons away from things like knowledge is power uh, being good television two seasons in a row, but really only because uh, people let that information out. Um, I, I do think, you know, something you've talked about a ton uh, in the past that, you know, they need to like have all the players with the information of uh, what's going on in the game. But I do feel like that they want for for whatever reason they love like, oh, you're, you're, you're going to be shot even like, oh, we're going to read the votes right now. Like, uh, would that have changed anything if the players knew that they were reading the votes on, you know, at the tribal council? I don't think so. Like, I don't think anybody changes their vote because it's going to be read immediately, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. Um, All good stuff. Taryn, anything else? Final thoughts on Survivor 42? Um, I, I think that, uh, I think that like the biggest headline we kind of opened with, which is um, if you're going to take anything away from this season, gameplay wise, it's look at Marianne's final tribal performance. It's, uh, a class by itself uh you know just just watch it uh listen to her talk with with rob when she does uh to explain her thought process going into it um and why she made the choices that she did um because she seemingly took a situation where she was not going to win and changed it into one where she did win um and i think if we're going to add anything to it it's it's that it wasn't just the final tribal performance 
you can't you can't just win on that alone. Uh, she got to the finish line with there with the final job performance, but it was also the work and the planning and the relationship building um, that she did prior to that that allowed her to to work. Uh, her magic with the final tribal performance. So um, keep the final tribal performance in mind as you're playing, uh, and that can be a big thing that uh, that you might learn from season 42. All right. Uh, well, Taryn, uh, great job here on the Survivor Academy, and uh, we'll learn a lot more when we have uh, more of these interviews. And it's feeling like this is going to be a season where we have a lot. I don't know if it's going to be Taryn, Big Brother Canada, 10 levels, but... <laughs> Uh, I feel like, uh, you know, I've been in contact with a lot of the players and they all seem up for it. So this is a really fun group. I, I, I really like this. I, I don't know if it's been said, uh, but I, I, the Survivor 42 cast is really good. Casting has been great. The editing, I think, has been uh, interesting. Good mm-hmm. in some areas, bad in other areas. But uh, in, in terms of like how they've been in the past, I think it's been maybe a little better um in, in at least some areas again but uh yeah the the casting i think in particular has been some of the best uh parts of the recent seasons of survivor and i think this cast was very fun okay taryn what's coming up for you um big brother in a, in a few weeks yeah here you ready uh just about a, a a month or so away from the season 24 premiere uh which means probably a cast drop about a week before that um and uh you know leading up to that, uh, just come hang out on Twitch with me, twitch.tv slash Taryn Armstrong, uh, playing some some games like uh, like Among Us and Goose Goose Duck, where you you lie to your friends and uh, you play little little mini survivor games, essentially, uh, every week. So uh, tune in for that. And as I said, I've been uh, making some videos uh, on those, uh, so you can check those out on yeah, my what YouTube What kind of channel. videos? Like you, you, go, you go back and you, and you watch like an old game? Yes, uh, all the way back to the start. I've uh, just put together some of the more interesting games that we've played uh, with uh, either fun, funny moments or uh, interesting results or maybe even just like teachable things of just like uh, this was a really effective game from uh, an imposter who was lying or something or this is how we caught somebody who was lying. Uh, Mm -hmm. So uh, they're fun. Okay, it's very interesting. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, Taryn, thank you so much for uh, lending your expertise to us here in the Survivor Academy. I greatly appreciate it. Of course, uh, we have uh, a ton of Survivor stuff coming your way here. And of course, uh, all of our Big Brother coverage coming as well. Uh, and of course, you want to make sure you're subscribed for it all. Uh, thank you for joining us here on the Survivor Academy all season long. This was a lot of fun for me to go through. So thank you for being here and uh, hope to do more of this in the future. Take care, everybody. Have a good one. Bye.